Arcade. If you're beginning to suspect this game has a rather eccentric personality, you're right. We'll give you a thousand dollars if you can explain the scoring system to us in under two minutes and make me understand it. Your time starts now. <laughs> you can keep your money for a start. Chase the door and chase the last gallery. 3015. There's one very unusual concept in it, and uh, the best way to describe it is uh, King Henry inventing it because he was so big and fat that he couldn't cover the court. So he went ahead and devised a set of rules that meant if he didn't get the ball before it bounced twice, he hadn't lost that point. He gets to go to the other end and have a shot at hitting a better one. And if he does, he, he still wins the point. If he doesn't, then he loses it. Tennis first became a truly royal game in the 14th century when King Louis X of France first stepped onto a court. Unfortunately, one day after a particularly energetic match, he drank a beaker of cold water caught a chill and died. One hundred and eighty-two years later, Charles VIII was in such a hurry to get on court, he banged his head on the doorpost on the way in, suffered massive head injuries, and he too died. Royal tennis was proving something of a health hazard for French kings. About 400 years later, Samuel Smith Travers brought the game to Australia, or more specifically, to an old brewery in Davy Street, Hobart. A fan of the game in England, he claimed he was becoming fat and feeble in the colonies, and if he was to prolong his valuable life, he desperately needed a twice-weekly sweat. 120 years on, and little has changed. Quentin McDougall first remembers running onto this court in about 1916. Now 86, the club patron has only just retired. Not that there's any harm in asking. Do you ever feel like getting out on the court again? No, no. I'd have to be very, very tempted, uh, very strongly tempted to do that because, and then it would be only to show off. With help from the man they call Q, it's time to open the windows and let in some fresh air. I'll have rough. Hello, I lose. You lose. Right here. Well, I'll take the service and the, all the best. The devil take you. <laughs> <laughs> Were you a good player? Oh, uh, cunning. All your faculties are being used all the time. You... I'm hampered. Bloody hell. It wasn't there. God. Uh, patience is a virtue. Uh, in royal tennis, as in any other game, and I didn't have enough just now. <laughs> the final has begun, and a capacity crowd of about a hundred has crammed into tiny, dark vantage points to see Faye do battle with former champion Wayne Davies. They will play over three days. The first to seven sets will be the winner. By the end of day two, Faye leads by six sets to two. He is just one short of victory. But there will be no match point. Davies, 14 years his senior, suffers a back strain and can't continue. The match ends in forfeit. Great. 
Rob Fay, Australia's little-known tennis great, is world champion again. But don't be fooled by all the little quirks we've served up to you here. It's a win of enormous merit. I guess today it isn't really the way you want to win the world championship, but uh, for two days we, uh, we really fought it out unbelievably hard. And I can tell you that uh, my body was really hurting. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. This trophy <coughs> is really what it's all about. Not Sylvia's self is more supremely fair than balls that hurtle through the conscious air. Not Chloe's harp more native to the ear than tense strings which smite the flying sphere. Let other people play at other things. The king of games is still the game of kings. Royal tennis lost somewhere in the time warp somewhere between squash and what we know as tennis these days. I love the line though, it wasn't there. <laughs> A bit like golf. After the break, the great Ron Clark challenges sports killer instinct.